And um, I welcome you all uh, to this uh, next uh, lecture in the series of the uh, uh, Light Talks for the International Year of Light. Uh, my name is David Sampson. Um, I am the uh, Western Australian member of the National Committee for the International Year of Light and uh, I am delighted to see such a great audience uh, here this evening. Um, but let me uh, begin um, by uh, acknowledging that it is the uh, tradition of the University of Western Australia to uh, acknowledge that uh, this university is situated on Noongar land and that the Noongar people remain the spiritual and cultural custodians of their land and continue to participate and pr continue to practice uh, their values, languages, uh, beliefs and, and knowledge. Um, so yes, Light Talks uh, is a, a series uh, where scientists and artists uh, talk about optics and uh, it is organised indeed to celebrate the 2015 International Year of Light which is uh, a global initiative adopted by the United Nations to raise the profile and awareness of how optical technologies uh, promote sustainable development and provide solutions to worldwide challenges in energy, education, agriculture, communications and health. And if you're interested in knowing more about that justification, just ask me afterwards and I'll come and talk to you about it for a whole hour with at least 100 PowerPoint slides, uh, by which time you would have well and truly been convinced. Um, but um, uh, I, um, before I actually uh, introduce the speaker, I would just like to uh, invite uh, to the podium uh, the president of the University of Western Australia uh, OSA student chapter, um, uh, which is a, a key sponsor of this event. Uh, his name is Andrea Curatolo, and I invite him to say a couple of words. Hello, everyone. I just want to say that this uh, 2015 uh, International Year of Light lecture series at UWA is co-sponsored by the Institute of Advanced Studies, the Lion's Eye Institute, the Optical Society, or OSA, the local uh, OSA student chapter of which I'm the president, the International Society for um, Optics and Photonics, or SPA. Uh, this is the second of the of three uh, light lectures, and the final lecture will be given by light artist, light artist Rebecca Bauman um, on October 22nd. There are flyers for this final lecture in the colonnade adjacent to the auditorium, and uh, also flyers for the uh, other events that the OSA student chapter will run throughout the year, including information on how to join. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrea. Um, so now it's an absolute delight to uh, invite a, a dear colleague, uh, David Mackey, who is the uh, director or managing director of the Lions Eye Institute. Um, he has uh, performed that role for some time now, so he's a, a, a well-established figure in Western Australia, and he is an eminent ophthalmologist with an international reputation uh, for his research in the genetics of eye disease. Um, he is, uh, is going to uh, give a very fascinating talk today. Uh, in fact, on your left uh, here you see actually a cross-sectional image of the retina, but I believe the retina may not be the focus of your talk today. I'm not sure. I'm excited to discover. I think the colour of the eyes may come from a little different area of the anatomy of the eye, but uh, I'm sure we are all going to be delightfully uh, intrigued to learn what David has to tell us this evening. So without further ado, let me introduce David Mackey. Thank you very much, David. It's a great honour to have been invited to give the talk, and really I'm bridging the colour between art and science. It's a lovely space to be in. And artists will think of colours in terms of mixing them in their paints to create an image. Physicists will think of light in terms of the properties of the wavelength and the energy of the light. A neuroscientist, however, will think of photoreceptor pigments and neural processing that allow the interpretation of colour. But colour is actually an illusion. It is reliant on the brain to interpret what colour we see. So with the possible exception of the Mona Lisa here, we actually have some portraits by famous artists of their own eyes. And as you would find with any art restorer, colours of paintings fade or darken over time and with the projector at the back of the room maybe not 
showing the light exactly as it was perceived. These colours may not be as the artists themselves perceived them. But colour is actually in the eyes of the beholder, and here's my slight scientific proof for that. So I need to have some audience participation for this next section. Now, previously I would ask people to say what colour are the eyes of your partner that you've come here with, uh, but that caused some problems, and if it is causing any problems, <laughs> the exits are to the right, the left, and the back here. So you better refresh on this. However, what I'd like us to do, everyone who thinks their eyes are blue, or sometimes people regard grey, I, I call them all blue. Who's got blue eyes? Hands up. Who has green or hazel eyes? And who has brown eyes? Oh, we've got a lovely even spread around the room. So participation science here. So bad news for the blue-eyed people. Um, this was a study that was done in San Francisco, <laughs> and it actually shows there are some features um, that eye colour can be associated with. However, this is sort of maybe other factors are involved, such as your ethnicity and if your parents are Chinese. Now, classifying eye colour, as common and as obvious it is, there is no standard classification of eye colour. The earliest published um, classification that I could find was actually in French. An interesting thing here is we have this slight lost in translation issue of what exactly do you mean by that colour? And I would probably interpret that what translates as auburn we'd probably call hazel, although my francophone sister-in-law disputed this with me as we tried to sort this colour out. Um, the first classification that I could find in the English language was by Sir William Wilde, and he came up with four basic colours. Now, he's probably more famous for being the father of Oscar Wilde, uh, the famous playwright. So, a trivia question here. What colour were Oscar Wilde's eyes? Grey. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, uh, if you blog him, um, many of the websites who do in mention this say they were grey. Um, there have been other classifications, again, French and English predominantly, and you can see that people look at eye colour in quite a few different ways and looking at classifying them. A problem with all of these is they're a descriptive language. A problem with any of the paintings of eye colour, as I showed earlier, is that they can change over time. And the first rigorous classification of eye colour came by uh, Dr Martin at, uh, a bit over a hundred years ago where he created these artificial eyes and the glass eyes actually retain their colour. And these 16 different colours, this is actually one of these sets um, in the Powerhouse Museum in Sydney if you want to see that. There have been numerous classifications since, some of them used in medical research. We were looking at eye colour in twins as part of our research, and one of the things our group decided upon is really it's more of a continuum moving across the spectrum from green through to brown. And it seems that you build up the dark brown pigment around the edge of the pupil, and this can extend out um, to eventually being full brown. So I'd like to go back a bit, um, quite a long way back, and my question for the audience is, what colour was the Big Bang? Physicists in the audience. So if you had paid attention to the original statement that I, a colour is actually a perception, given that there was no one around at the time of the Big Bang, there would have been no colour. Asking it slightly differently, what wavelengths of light were present, well actually at the very beginning um, there weren't any um, light um, wavelengths there. And in fact it took a microsecond to actually get photons being formed. And in fact it was several hundred thousand years before visible light appeared in the universe. So light's a little bit of a latecomer um, here, but then all the colours that we perceive have been expanding. But the one remnant colour in inverted commas um, is the background radiation that won the Nobel Prize in 1978. Uh, this is the um, antenna that they actually discovered with and that's in the microwave end of the spectrum so that's on the red side. 
So light, as the physicists would think of it, is related to either a wave or a particle. That's the dual nature of light. We have the frequency or the wavelength that helps define what the hue of light is. Now, hue is actually the physical property that most of us think of when we're talking about colour. And as you go across the spectrum, we have cosmic rays, gamma rays, X-rays, and then coming into UV light. And then we hit violet and then go through the spectrum. And then we go out through infrared and radar and the various other transmission waves um, that we have. Now, the hues that we know of in the rainbow, which many of our primitive ancestors would have seen for millennia, actually there are only five colours originally that were described, and they were red, yellow, green, blue and violet. And it was uh, Sir Isaac Newton, the physicist, who decided that this did not have the same harmony that existed with music. And he insisted we added two new colours to give the spectrum seven colours uh, so that it would fit with music. So he added orange and indigo um, to the colours of the rainbow, which most children will learn at some stage. Newton also described some other properties of light, and that is that light waves will interfere with each other and cancel each other out. And a phenomenon you may see if you look at an oily surface, um, you may get this appearance that looks a little bit like a rainbow, but it's actually white light cancelling each other out. So you have peaks and troughs of light, and these are known as Newton rings. This interference actually has been fantastic for ophthalmology. You know, it's one of the principles used to allow us to judge the depth that light reflects off different surfaces of tissues. And we can now image the different layers of the retina, including um, the deepest layer, um, which is where the rods and cones are, as well as the retinal uh, bipolar and horizontal cells which show the signalling and process the image to then transmit them to the ganglion cells that go back to the brain. Now apart from hue, other physical properties of light that influence their colour are saturation. So saturation is when you add white light to a colour to desaturate it. And probably the best known of these is when we take red light and add white to it, it becomes pink with the more white that you add. Now, not only does this desaturation occur, it actually varies the perception of the underlying colour a little bit. And there are these physical properties um, that we have in vision perception where a colour may move towards a greener or a yellower end of the spectrum depending which end of the spectrum it lies. The brightness also influences the way that we perceive a colour. Now, I haven't actually changed the brightness here, but the surrounding light differs with the white and the black bars at the top. And you will perceive those two blues look quite different. However, on the bottom corner, I've actually cut out a piece of each of those images to show they are indeed the same. And you get these phenomenon of things appearing bluer or greener, depending on how bright they appear. Also, where we've been. So if you've been outside in a bright environment or you've been inside in a dark environment, if you look at something, you will actually perceive it differently based on how dark adapted you are. So in an outside bright environment, the red colour will appear brighter, but at dusk, where it's more dim, and this is just a simulation of what you would notice, the greener background actually would appear lighter and this changes depending on your adaptation. So where does our light come from? Well, it comes from the sun. Now, the nuclear energy of the sun is actually producing mainly gamma rays, which we don't see, and it's the heat of the sun that's actually generating most of the colour. And this is the phenomenon of a black body uh, property of matter, and the hotter something is, changes the apparent wavelength or the apparent colour and the actual wavelengths that are transmitted from the body. Now one of the things that's sort of counterintuitive to us is that a cooler colour is actually the red end of the spectrum, whereas the hotter colours move towards the blue and white end of the spectrum. And if we look at this with stars, we have the cooler stars appear, they're more red-orange in colour, whereas the much hotter stars 
will be more blue in their appearance. Now we see this in the real world and I'm sure many of us have encountered this recently with a switching to energy efficient light bulbs and you notice that the redder incandescent bulb colours that you were used to of your home have now changed as you might have a bulb that has a higher colour temperature. Another phenomenon of light is that it gets scattered and if you look at the sky, if we didn't have any atmosphere, the sky would appear black. Now, before life on Earth started, what colour would have the sky been? I'll come back to that, despite the trick part of the question. But blue light is scattered more than red light, and that's why the sky appears blue. But in the evening at sunset and the morning at sunrise, you actually have a redder colour to the light. If you want to prove this scattering, a simple experiment that you can do is to actually put some white flour into a glass of water and you'll notice that it takes on a slightly blue tinge. Well, this uh, phenomenon, we, this just shows the different wavelengths as you get at different times of day. But this phenomenon of the Rayleigh scattering or the Tyndall effect is actually why eyes appear blue. In the centre you'll see the uh, very dark melanin pigment that is at the back of the iris and the iris in front of this in a blue eyed person is actually white and it is the scattering of light through this with a black background that gives the blue appearance. If you actually have no pigment at all, you begin seeing the red behind from the retina with its blood vessels, and that's an albino person on the right side of the screen. So eye colour. The most common perception or understanding of eye colour is that it is a recessive phenomenon and that brown eyes are dominant to blue. So if we have a parent who has brown eyes, say someone who's Chinese, marrying someone from Scandinavia who has blue eyes, as did all their family, you would find that their children would be carrying both the brown dominant gene and the blue recessive gene, but all of them would themselves appear to have brown eyes. If two of these people were, who are heterozygous, carrying a dominant and a recessive version of the gene, marry, a quarter of their children will have the two brown copies, like their parents had, Half of them would have a brown and blue and a quarter of them would have the two recessive blues and so one in four of the children will have blue eyes and that's how Mendel described dominant and recessive. If a blue-eyed person marries a blue-eyed person, all their children would be expected to have blue eyes. So here's a real-life scenario. In fact, it's my cousin and the question was asked indirectly by my other cousin. Um, that if you have someone with blue-green eyes who marries someone with blue-green eyes, um, how could they have two children with dark brown eyes? And he learned at school that it was recessive and how should we counsel him? Who here in the audience thinks we should send him to a family lawyer? <laughs> so the examples here and you can see there's quite a lot of pigment in the children but the parents don't have it. How could that work out? Well, it's because there are multiple steps in the biochemical pathway to actually make pigment to colour the eyes. And you can be recessive at different steps in this pathway and therefore people who may have blue eyes could be blue at a different part of the pathway and therefore if they marry may be able to produce pigment. Now when we look at the genes for producing pigment, this is some twins from our twins eye study, you can see the twins on the left, you've got the right and left eyes of twin one and twin two and I've got a top and bottom pair there, how similar they are. Whereas the non-identical twins like any brother and sister have quite a large amount of variation. When we studied the twins from Brisbane as part of the Brisbane Adolescent Twin Study, we looked at genetic linkage and found a dramatic influence of one gene region over the oculocutaneous albinism 2 gene. There were several other regions that came up as significant, although not as dramatic as this OCA2 gene, which is the main explanation for blue eyes in Europeans. Now another example of 
Subtle variation in these albinism genes give us subtle variation in eye colour. But if you're completely missing the genes, you get albinism. And here was a case reported of a man with albinism who made no pigment marrying a woman with albinism who made no pigment and their children actually having a normal amount of pigmentation. Now you could get the same family lawyer as earlier, but this was the real proof that we were dealing with genes at multiple levels of the pathway. And showing it schematically here, you can see on the left, if every step in the pathway is allowing 100% pigmentation to occur, you'll get a lot of pigment. But if the blockage is in the second step in the pathway or even the first step in the pathway, you won't get any pigment made and albinism. Whereas someone who's a carrier, such as the children of the man and woman with albinism or the uh, children of the uh, man and woman with blue eyes, you will get some pigment made, although not as much. And we often see this in the real world where a baby might have fair hair and blue eyes and at, over time increase the amount of pigmentation that they develop. Now this actual phenomenon was key to influencing the genetic career of one of the top geneticists of the um, 20th century, and that was Victor McCusick, who was at Johns Hopkins. He created the OMIM genetics database. And it was because he and his identical twin brother had dark brown eyes, and mum and dad had blue eyes. And I bet you he spent a lot of his childhood wondering about genetics. This is a quote from his textbook. Indeed, when we did a large analysis of eye colour genes from the twins in Australia as well as the UK and the population studies in the Netherlands, we found a large number of genes involved in the variation in eye colour and most of these also cause albinism if both are missing. This study, we, rather than classifying people into eye colour, we deal, dealt with it as a continuous spectrum of hue and saturation. And you can see how the individuals on the bottom slides actually fell in this analysis. And from that, we were able to identify the different genes involved. If you look at the European population, you can see that blue eyes predominantly come from around the Baltic region, where the percentage of people with blue eyes is the greatest. But even in Australia, there has been a subtle um, shift in the number of blue-eyed individuals. So the fair people probably found the sunshine of Queensland rather intense. And in the era before sunscreens and air conditioning, many of the early settlers who were fair probably stayed or moved to Tasmania, whereas those who were more heavily pigmented may have moved further north. But there are significantly more light blue eyes in the Tasmanian twins that we study in our twin eye study compared with the Queensland twins. So eyes do change colour as we age. Despite it being something well known to most European parents, there's almost no literature on the change in eye colour in babies and what to expect and what to predict, although this will certainly happen in the coming years. There are also some diseases that affect the colour of our eyes, and eyes do change subtly as we get old. Probably one of the most dramatic changing, or, or sorry, one of the most dramatic coloured eyes were the green eyes of the Afghan girl. I had the privilege of spending some time with John Daugman uh, at Cambridge University discussing uh, iris analysis. He developed the iris recognition programs that you see at the British airports, and we were looking at using this in our twin study. And he was the one who actually proved um, that the uh, lady they subsequently identified, Shabat Gula, was indeed the original girl from the earlier photo. But you can see over 18 years, some of the luster has gone from her eyes. There are diseases that influence the pigmentation of the eye. If you have um, a dramatic fight or flight response from adrenaline, usually your pupils will dilate and your eyes will open widely. However, if you have damage to your sympathetic nervous system, this response doesn't occur. And you'll notice that the eye on the right side here, the blue eye, has a smaller pupil and a slightly droopy eyelid. And this is known as Horner's syndrome. But if this happens in a baby from an injury at birth, 
the eye won't pigment normally, and thus the eye should have become a hazel colour as seen on the opposite side, but remained blue. We have other people such as David Bowie, who many people wonder if he has Horner's syndrome of his right eye, but apparently his eye colour change happened after an eye injury of his left eye where he actually has a fixed dilated pupil. And we do see pigmentation developing with some diseases. The top eye on the right has a disease called neurofibromatosis with the brown pigment spots developing. And the eye on the bottom are the white spots or brush field spots that we see in children with Down syndrome. Inflammatory diseases can erode the pigment of the eye. And this disorder known as Fuchs heterochromic cyclitis has now been shown to be due to a baby being infected with rubella but not developing the severe problems during the pregnancy. But later in life, this virus flaring up again and causing inflammation, damaging the pigment. More recently, a famous change in eye colour came out earlier this year where Dr Ian Crozier, who is the sickest ever survivor of Ebola syndrome, he was a doctor working in West Africa. He was evacuated to Atlanta. He recovered uh, dramatically after almost every organ, in his, organ system in his body had failed. And he had apparently fully recovered, but then developed some blurring of vision in one eye and marked inflammation. And the photos of his eye colour shows the uh, eye on the right side having a greener tinge. And this was due to the inflammation caused by the Ebola. And quite alarmingly, it was discovered that he, although he had cleared the Ebola from his bloodstream and was no longer infectious, he still had some Ebola virus active in his eye. Now, coming back to our perception of light, it was actually two scientists, Thomas Young and Hermann van Helmholtz, who really came up with what we now know as the trichromatic theory of colour vision. Now, Helmholtz is also very famous in ophthalmology because he invented the ophthalmoscope. This was the first device that allowed us to see inside the back of the eye. And this is one of the museum pieces owned by Professor Ian McAllister here in Perth. And Alex Hewitt is examining the back of my eye. However, this is somewhat challenging to use. And now we have some incredible equipment, such as adaptive optics, this is using a lot of the physics and computing technology that was developed in astronomy, particularly for the Hubble telescope, where we can now see the individual cone cells in a retina. And from looking at this, we've actually been able to detect that not everyone has the same array of cones. We have different percentages of green, red and blue cones at the back of the eye and clearly that will affect the way that people perceive colour. So the trichromatic theory in action is looking at these slides that I've shown you with all these wonderful colours. We've only been having three light colours shone at the screen and they are red, green and blue. And it's the mixture of these that give us our cyan, magenta and yellow, which are the complementary colours of each of the primaries, or all three of them give us white. And to show this in demonstration, looking at the section in the middle of the slide here, you can see from the pixel illumination at the bottom that the top left, the red colour is just the red LEDs shining. Uh, the bottom left, the uh, magenta is the red and blue. The top right, the yellow, is just the red and the green. And the bottom right, the white, is all three of them firing. So this is the trichromatic theory in action. And it's the red cones, the green cones, and the blue cones, the sending signals that then get processed. The red and the green are actually cross-wired to give us a yellow perception, which then interacts with the blue perception. And then all of this is processed through multiple cell layers in the retina and again through the brain to give us the perceptions of colours that we see. So another question to ask. When I was a kid at school, I was so jealous of those other children who got 48 different colour pencils, or even <laughs> the kid who had 96. Do you really need this? Well, I'm going to save a lot of parents and grandparents a lot of grief by convincing you, you only need to buy your kid four coloured pencils. <laughs> 
As anyone who goes to change the toner in the colour printer knows, you only need cyan, magenta, yellow, and to save a bit of money, a black one. And that's all you need, and you can make all the colours that you need. So if you've got a budding young artist, four pencils, off you go. So we've got two different phenomena happening here. So we've got additive colours is when we're actually adding light. But then when we're using pigments such as in printing and art, it's subtractive colours. So we're actually putting in cyan, magenta and yellow and ending up with a white piece of paper going black. Now, these aren't quite exactly the same, but showing here how the lights, as would appear at the back of the uh, screen here, projecting on the wall, gives us white. If we're looking at printing, you can see adding the yellow, magenta and cyan together will give us the black phenomenon. Now, back in 1931, there was a commission to try and work out how could we classify every single colour that existed using this trichromatic theory. And they came up with what is now known as the CIE diagram, and pretty much every colour that you can come up with or can perceive is within this um, array of these three different dimensions. Now if we look at colour temperature that I alluded to earlier, you can see colour temperature on the right side is the cooler red colours moving across to the hotter blue end of the spectrum. Now comparing the colours that we get from a printed piece of paper to that of projected lights isn't exactly the same and I'm sure this is where a lot of variation in how we perceive colours differently can occur, as I'll demonstrate later. But what colours actually are there and all the names that have been added to them? So there have been some classifications, a lot of the printing documents, a lot of the computer screens have come up with all these wonderful names for different colours, starting at A and moving through, where you can give the percentage of your three basic red, green and blue lights to give these colours. But different computer screens and monitors are going to be slightly different depending on what LED they're using. So we've got different shades of red, or different shades of green, different shades of blue. And I actually like looking at some of the colours and working out where did the actual name come from. And so, for instance, one of the colours in the brown spectrum is known as burnt sienna. This is a colour that a lot of artists used in the classic period. Some of the paintings I showed earlier will have used this pigment as one of the skin tones. And this was the colour of the clay from around Siena in Italy that was turned into a paint pigment. The other area of colour shades that I found a bit interesting was I actually came up with 77. Um, so what the popular literature think um, is sort of a bit under-reporting. Now for those of you who've had enough of 50 shades of grey and would like to have less of it, what I want you to do is to put your hand up like this in front of the middle of the screen for the next slide. So, so we can tell the voyeurs in the audience here. Um, and so this was another image that's um, out there. And you can see if you block that very middle part of the image, that the top and bottom part of the grey are actually the same shade. But if you look at the whole thing, your brain will convince you that the top and bottom are different. And this is because it is the surrounding colours influence the colour that you perceive. And this is an important phenomenon that we had to evolve when we were hunter-gatherers. We needed to be able to tell if fruit was ripe, whether it was midday and we we're out there gathering it, or whether it was dusk or dawn. So our brain needed to be able to keep the relative colours constant despite what the background illumination colour or colour temperature might be. And so within our retina, within our brain, the colour at the centre is influenced by the colours around it as to what colour you will perceive. And so you get these various neurological pathways of inhibition and excitation occurring at layers in the retina. And you see the two um, purple colours here in the different backgrounds appear slightly different. You also get fatigue of colour and it will change over time. If everyone looks at the centre of the four different colours there, so we've got the uh, little dot in the middle, stare at that. I'll hold this here for about 15 seconds. And so we have our primary colours of red, 
green and blue. Yellow itself is actually from the green and red. And then what I want you to do is to then look across at the dot on the other side. Now many of these tricks have been done with things like the American flag, but you'll now see the complementary colours of those primary colours. So you'll be seeing cyan, magenta, yellow and blue um, with those other colours. So you also get after images. So what I'd like you to do here is um, look at one of the eyes of my uh, two emojos. Does everyone know here the difference between emoticons and emojis? Um, these are emojis, not emoticons. But if you stare at one of the eyes there for a little while, um, we'll see another example of this uh, change in colour um, with a period of time. So I pick the two main uh, red and green, which are the two pigments that are coded for on the X chromosome. And if you look at the black screen there, you'll see the after images there. Okay. So we have all these impossible colours now that are known of. Things like hyperbolic orange, self-luminous red and Stygian blue. So Stygian blue is named after the Styx River, which was the colour of the water as you cross the Styx to enter the afterlife. So if we look at these here, staring at one of the crosses here, you'll notice how these colours will change and that's because of your earlier experience will influence the way you perceive a colour in a subsequent image. I've actually taken these from the internet and not ascribed um, an origin for them because they're on about four different sites and I don't know who's the original creator of these. But this is what you should be seeing, the um, row on the right side here. So you get this blue and black simultaneously. You'll get the after image of a red on the white background. And you'll get this more intense orange than the surrounding um, orange with the hyperbolic orange. So here are some other hyperbolic colours. If we look at this, it'll flicker <coughs> back and forth between these two. And you'll see within the squares of colour, you'll get this circle in the middle coming out more intensely and influencing what you see. And then what are called the luminous colours, if you stare at these, you'll notice as the white background, you'll get the complementary colours to the ones that you are looking at because of the fatigue of the retinal cells that have been involved. So I want to go back in time, not as far as I did earlier, um, but answer the question about what colour the sky was before life started. No one was here, so we don't know, but it's presumed that the sky was probably orange uh, when we had just nitrogen and carbon dioxide. And as the bacteria, as shown on the stromatolites here, created oxygen, and life changed on Earth, bacteria decided that they needed to know where's the light. You know, I need to get into the light to get my chlorophyll absorbing it or I might want to avoid the light if I'm sensitive to it. And so bacteria developed these pigments that were able to respond to light and they actually activated chemical pathways that allowed the cell to move towards or away from the light. And it's from these opsin molecules that our visual pigments eventually evolved. Although excitingly in science, researchers have gone back to these original pigments and used them as a way of turning on and turning off cells. And you can now put these various bacterial opsins into cells, such as neural cells in mice, shine a particular wavelength of laser light at the cell and you can activate or switch on or switch off particular neural pathways. And this whole field of optogenetics deserves not just a talk but a whole lecture series. 
So the other thing, a little bit more recently, that happened was, if you go through the fossil records, the Cambrian period was when life exploded on Earth. We had a massive diversification of biology in both plants and in animals, and really this was an arms race. People, uh, animals and plants struggling for survival. And most of this was driven by the development of colour vision. So people, or sorry, animals would try to hunt or be hunted and therefore uh, avoid being the prey of whoever was seeing them. So camouflage developed, certain plants wanted to be seen, so they'd attract birds and bees. Now if we look at the dinosaurs and birds, they actually had four colour pigments. Whereas the primates, uh, we have three, but other mammals actually only have two. And that's because mammals evolved after the age of the dinosaurs. We were hiding in the dark uh, and just getting around at night. We didn't need to waste all our resources on seeing different colours at night. So talking a bit about the birds and the bees, um, we have here the four different colours that they can perceive. So flowers actually have quite a few colours in the ultraviolet area for these to perceive. And therefore the daisy shown at the bottom appears very different to a bird or a bee. An obvious uh, question is a red rag to a bull uh, is actually a black rag. Um, they do not see red, so it's all a bit of a nonsense uh, when you go to a bullfight. It's the motion of the red rag uh, and more of the theatre rather than doing anything to the bull. And I love Larson because he can always subtly bring up an idea without it being that obvious. But no matter what colours you like to show your dog, they're colour blind. So why did primates rediscover colour vision? And one of the theories was that it was so that we could tell if food was ripe and therefore pick the right berries and therefore survive. Although a more recent theory is that it may have been to tell which leaves were redder. And in times of starvation when we were looking for any form of food, if you actually eat red leaves, they have less roughage and more sugar and protein than older green leaves. So this may be why we evolved to rediscover colour. Now, a famous researcher in chemistry, Thomas Dalton, had actually noticed that he and his brother had a problem perceiving colours. And his theory was that they had a tint in the vitreous humour of their eyes. And he wrote quite extensively about this back in the 1700s. Now, the observation of colour blindness is this is actually an X-linked inherited disorder. So usually it's men who are affected and their mothers and their daughters are carriers, although very occasionally an affected man and a carrier woman may marry and therefore their daughters may be affected, but it's less than 1%. But colour blindness in men is about 8%. And looking at the CIE diagram, if you're missing a blue pigment, which is actually extremely rare, you'll confuse colours along the blue axes that are shown. If you're missing a red pigment, you'll confuse colours along the red axis and a blue, green pigment along the green axis as shown there. So it would be problematic in telling if something was ripe or not. Now to test colour vision, we use our Ishihara plates. And this is just a control one. Everyone should be able to see this. However, most of the audience should be noting 8, 6, 29 and 57. But some people in the audience would actually notice 3, 5, 70 and 35. So although we say people are colour blind, it's actually that they perceive colours differently and definitely see through a coloured camouflage to notice the shades of the grey undertone there. In this example, most people say they couldn't see any numbers there, although with the projection you do actually get a hint of it. But a colourblind person would usually notice 5, 2, 45 and 73. And here we have the colours of the um, left side, which the red defect versus the right side, the green <coughs> defect um, can detect. So this is how we test quickly if someone has a colour variation. They have scoring cards, although there's a whole lot of different books, so don't try to learn it off by heart, which is what some people going for a licence might do. 
There are other ways of testing where you can compare the central colour here with the surrounding ones, or we can get people to arrange 84 different coloured beads all in order across the spectrum, as shown here on the CIE diagram. And there are other ones that show different wavelengths of light, where you can match a yellow light with a red and green light, and people with different colour anomalies will match these differently. If we look at the frequency of the genetic abnormalities, most of it's actually subtle variation in green. We get absence of green in about 1%, variation in red in 1%, and absence in red in 1%. Um, the blue abnormalities are extremely rare. Now, other diseases can mess up our colour vision. So some diseases of the retina, some diseases of the optic nerve can also cause people to get colour abnormalities. But usually they'd have trouble reading any of the numbers on those plates shown earlier, rather than a very specific pattern. Example of a disease that affects colour perception, coming back to art, is cataracts. So in the past, where people's cataracts would be quite advanced before they were operated on, Claude Monet, who's famous for his uh, bridge at Giovanni, his colour moved from the bluer, greener end of the spectrum as his yellowing cataract made him not only lose clarity, but also changed his perception of the colour of what he's painting. After his cataract surgery, he went back to being blue again. Now, another test that people may misinterpret uh, when they get uh, their eyes checked is this one. This is a duochrome. This actually isn't testing your colour vision. This is testing whether you're in focus, whether you're a bit long-sighted or a bit short-sighted. And this is because red light and green light actually focus at different positions. To give an example of this, so some people will be seeing the red side clearer. They probably need their myopic glasses strengthened a little bit. Those on the right side who see the green clearer uh, probably need their hyperopic strength increased a little bit. Um, but the reason for this happening, and showing with prisms here, which people understand, but the lens will also do this. You get this chromatic aberration where the blue light is actually focused in front of the retina, the red light is focused behind the retina. Coming back to um, people with colour vision abnormalities, so don't send your colourblind husband to buy the peppers uh, capsicums. Um, you will get a reasonable mixture, no matter what one you ask for. Looking at camouflage, interestingly, you see things slightly differently um, with the camouflage on the bottom left uh, has actually been adjusted for a person with a red-green defect, and there's a great program on uh, the internet you can get called Daltonize, where you can simulate images um, to look like that of a colourblind person, and therefore if you're wanting to market to these people, maybe make your website a bit colour vision friendly. So how on earth do we tolerate 8% of men having colour blindness? There must have been an advantage in having this many people colour blind. Um, apart from them being useless at going out and hunt, picking uh, fruit, um, it probably had an advantage in hunting. And there's some good theories that hunters did a lot better if the group of hunting men had a mixture of colourblind and non-colourblind individuals. So the whole sex differentiation of hunter-gathering probably is wired in our genes, why this has evolved. Now, looking at hunting, a really clever thing that was done um, by some researchers in the United States is they said, look, the animal hunters are looking at don't see colour. Why don't we look at the colour pigments of the deer's retina, work out what colours they won't see that humans will see, and come up with camouflage so hunters don't shoot each other. And they invented this deeroflage, or covert orange. Um, this was a brilliant science, but pathetic marketing, in that very few of the hunters actually got what this was really about and wouldn't buy it because the deer's going to see that. Anyway, <laughs> colour abnormalities. So this is the spectrum most people should see. The palette of someone who's missing the red will look like this. For someone who's missing their green, this is how they will usually perceive these colours. So for instance, an artist who actually, this is an artist whose painting I'm about to show, this is how he arranged his colour palette 
And this is how he painted until it was explained to him it would be a lot better if he just did charcoal drawings, which he went on to become famous with. So our colour options, we've got two on the X chromosome, the red or long wavelength, the green or medium, and the blue or short wavelength is on chromosome 7. And the red and green probably evolved, how we developed our trichromatic theory, from a duplication of the same gene. And then over time, subtle changes in the amino acid sequence gave the different spectral sensitivities to these opsin pigments. And it's actually a mixture of them. You, we actually have it usually more than two copies of these. Some people can have five or even seven copies of these, but it's usually just the first two that we run off. You can get hybrids where you've um, got half of one, half of another. And so there's not just one variation of color abnormality or variation. There's actually a lot of possible variations. And so just changing a single amino acid will change the peak sensitivity of that opsin pigment. And in women who are carriers, their retina actually is a mixture of colour blind and colour normal. So if you shine a coloured laser across their retina, as you move across, the colour will actually change. So it must be a really interesting phenomenon to perceive. Um, I'd love to try and get a video simulation of that created. We do have some diseases where you get overrepresentative of the blue cones, and this blue um, cone override known as enhanced S cone syndrome exists where people just see so much more blue than the red or the greens. Now David Hunt who's in the audience tonight um, did one of these really nifty little pieces of science a few years ago. Now Dalton whom I'd mentioned earlier after he don died donated his eyes to find out the explanation of his colour vision abnormality. And although Dalton proposed that he would have a tint within his vitreous, this wasn't the case. And subsequently, David's team tracked down Dalton's actual pathology specimen of his eye, did DNA analysis on this, and showed um, that he was in fact a deuteranope and contradicted the famous scientist Thomas Young who predicted that uh, Dalton was actually a protonope. So congratulations on a nifty piece of science. Um, if you want to know what colour blindness is like, there are a lot of apps out there that can s simulate colour blindness if you want to see what it's like. It can modify things so that colour blind people can see them better. It can test you whether you're colour blind or not. And there are quite a lot of these available. The Cold Blind uh, website has all these great links to that. Now, another thing we found online earlier this year is showing the power of crowdfunding. A group of uh, filmmakers decided they wanted to make a film showing what it was like to be colourblind and managed to get 200 donors to come up with, I think, the $50,000 uh, to actually fund the film. Uh, and this hopefully will be out uh, fairly soon. But with colourblind people, there is colour discrimination out there. And this is an area that we're interested in in our research team at the Lion's Eye Institute. Now, to tell 8% of men that they can't be pilots, they can't join the military, or that they um, can't be members of the police force is probably a stupid thing to do, but has happened in Australia. It's a little bit less... Uh, noticeable at the moment, but the arguments were that train drivers, tram drivers, truck drivers might go through red lights if they don't see red as well. Um, this light on the bottom uh, shows that maybe our signage needs to be a bit better. A colour normal individual went through this sign and caused the Paddington Rail disaster. Um, the police force, um, when I had a patient who was colour blind wanting to fight the police force over this, uh, gave the following arguments to why this boy shouldn't join the Victorian police force. WA's police force at the moment ignores whether you're colour blind or not. Um, but many of their arguments, I think, were a bit silly, um, particularly the last one, because although he may not see red in the same way as other people, there will be scenes, at, uh, evidence at the crime scene that a colourblind person may pick up that a colour normal person won't. Maybe we need to have teams of people out there doing our work in these scenarios. 
Now, the pilots are actually very uh, emotive about this. There have been quite a few big court cases going back and forward. Uh, there's a bit of bias in that the main expert witness for uh, saying they shouldn't fly is a professor of optometry in Melbourne who sold every optometrist in the country a special kit uh, to test everybody, so I think he has a slight vested interest there. But um, they are always keen to um, argue why do you need colour vision to fly a plane? If you're seeing the little red and green lights, uh, which way the plane's going, you're a lot closer than you're legally allowed to be. In medicine, it's argued that colourblind people may not be able to detect cyanosis as easily. They may not detect some bruising, and particularly in pathology, may have some problems. But you can put coloured filters in front of the colourblind individual. I always love doing this um, with a person diagnosed with colour blindness, showing them that they can read the Ishihara plates if I give them a red lens to look through. However, if someone's protonopic, they'll interpret the dark end of the red as black. Uh, and we can't do anything to fix this. Um, so if you ever see someone turn up at a funeral with a red tie, um, they're probably colourblind and might be polite to let them know. In ophthalmology, we worried about this. Would people on a red retinal background pick up a pigmented lesion there? And using the Daltonized program, I changed this pigmented lesion over a vessel, and you could see they'd actually possibly miss that, though you can usually pick it up. And particularly from three-dimensional cues, you should be able to pick up a melanoma in the eye. But rather than saying people with colour blindness shouldn't do things, we should look at rewiring the world literally so that they can. And this was actually done, mainly because colour normal people were being killed by electrocution. And you can see in the dim lighting here that it is hard to tell the difference between the black, the green and the red. Whereas on the right, the brown, blue and green are quite obvious. And we need to make sure that we adjust colours so colour variant individuals can perceive it. Now, the elephant not in the room for colour is, of course, fashion. Um, this is an important thing. There's a whole cosmetics industry and fashion industry out there running on colour. So you know, I'm sure many of the audience know here that you should get your colours done, men as well. Um, this is where you look at the colours of your hair, the colours of your eye, the colours of your skin and decide what are the colours that you should have in your clothing and in your cosmetics. So these range from the cool colours, which are actually the hot ones on the bluer end of the spectrum, to the uh, warm colours, the red end of the spectrum, and then how much darkness or lightness in pigmentation. So split everyone up into four groups. And if you pick any colours within your band, you can mix and match most of your wardrobe without having any real clangers. Although someone who's colour variant may not agree with this, so any woman who has a colour blind husband, when he goes for that yellow tie, as he always will, you might tone him down a bit. <laughs> okay, the finale, the dress. So, I will do my quick poll in the audience. Who here perceives this as gold and white? Okay, and who in the audience as black and blue? So this has really um, taken the uh, world by storm and it is a huge combination of all the stuff that I've been through here. When I looked at a print version of this, as I said, the printed colours and light illumination colours are different. When I looked at a printed version of this in a dull area of the cafe with a bright light outside, I actually saw the black and blue dress. But here I actually see as the gold and white. Um, lots of polls went up online, but the magnificent source of crowd research that was done, and this is what the dress actually looks like, so the people who do say blue and black are correct, um, was 23andMe. So this is the direct-to-consumer DNA testing company who now have over a million people, including myself and my brother, who've contributed our DNA and have been involved in a lot of research. Now, the American um, 
uh, FDA has stopped them having anything to do with diseases, but this fell straight into their variations in the population's research. So back in um, February, after the initial uh, photo came out, everyone on their database, all a million people, got emailed the, would you like to look at this dress and tell us what colour you think it is? So it was a simple, you know, this one or that one answer. And then they linked that to all their previous data. So within a week, they had 25,000 people participating in this piece of research. They found no clear genetic association with this, so it's not definitely related to colour blindness, though I will show that there. They found identical twins who actually reported seeing different colours. One gene, although not dramatically significant, did come up as a possible one. Maybe in time, as they increase their numbers, this will become real, and a whole new area of genetics research in colour perception will come from this. But this ANO6 gene is related to the ANO2 gene, which is expressed in the retina and may affect our perception of uh, images. The most obvious thing, and I noticed it in the audience here, is what age you are influences the results. So people who are aged around 50 or 60 are most likely to perceive white and gold, but the younger members of the audience and the older members of the audience will sway towards the um, black and blue alterations. Looking at eye diseases, this was quite interesting. People with cataract were more likely to see the black and blue. So you saw how Monet had perceived his colours with his cataract. That influences what colours we think we're seeing and replicating. Colourblind people were more likely to see white and gold, but most colourblind people love yellow. Um, and macular degeneration, which does affect colour, didn't seem to have any influence in this. The other thing that came up as a surprise was where you grew up influenced how you perceive the colour of the dress. Now, whether this is kids on farms get better nutrition, whether they're poisoned by chemicals, or whether it's just bright blue skies and yellow fields, or maybe it's the lack of living in the city and having any fashion sense um, that could influence how you perceive the dress. So anyway, this was a fun piece of crowdsourcing of science, and this is going to become more common as research goes by. And we're jumping into this space. One of the research areas collaborating with some people across the university in psychology, as well as David um, in animal biology and us at the Lions Eye Institute, we want to look at this issue of is there an advantage of teaming up colourblind and non-colourblind people in particular scenarios such as a search and rescue episode. If I go missing, I want you to match those people up to look for me. Interestingly, there's a lot of hearsay that various military, such as in the Second World War, the Vietnam War, the Rhodesian War, targeted colourblind individuals to help with some of their camouflage spotting. But nothing's ever been published scientifically about this, and it would be nice to fill this space with some of the um, material we had. Um, we'd like to raise money for doing this, and we'd like to source individuals for this study. So if you're interested, you can contact Julie at the Lions Eye Institute or myself about it. This will be coming online as a UWA crowdsourcing and crowdfunding project, hopefully later this year. Now, to end my talk today, I want everyone to fix their vision on the E in the 10. And I'm going to give you my 10 summary points of what I hope you have learnt from this evening's lecture. Firstly, colour is an illusion. The physical properties of light, the hue, which most of us misinterpret as colour, saturation and brightness are the main things that influence colour. Colour temperature, red, is actually cooler than blue. There are numerous classifications of eye colour, but ethnicity and disease do influence these, and the inflammation of the Ebola virus changed the colour of Ian Crozier's eye. As the sky is blue, the eye is blue due to the scattering of light. Blue eyes are usually recessive to brown, but there are multiple genes involved, so it's not an absolute, warn the lawyers. There are three primary colours, red, green and blue, that correspond with the three cone types. 
The three complementary colours, cyan, magenta and yellow, are the only colours you need to give your kid in their colouring pencils. Multiple factors, but particularly age and eye disease, influence the way people perceive the colours of that dress. And colour blindness affecting 8% of the population may have advantages in seeing through camouflage. So to conclude, and for those of you who missed it because you weren't concentrating, <laughs> um, so maybe some after images. And just a final thing for the weekend, showing that colour blindness can be a catastrophe in some circumstances. So with the Derby, this would be a problem if you're colour blind. So thank you.